Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, I've got a very special guest. He was kind enough to come back on. This is the second time on the podcast. We've got nine-time European Championship medalist, Pavel Sankovic. Hi, Coleman. Glad to be here again. <laughs> Today we're getting into some nitty gritty stuff. I'm really excited to talk about it with you. Um, you know, last time we kind of went through your story, your narrative uh, in your swimming career and now what you're doing with coaching. But today um, we're getting into the details and specific elements of core strength, underwater kick speed, turns, breakouts. We'll, we'll see how far we get, but um, let's, let's just start with the why, you know, you, you came to me with this topic and you're like, Hey, I really wanted to talk about this. Um, mm -hmm. What, what made the difference for you? Why is this such an emphasis for you personally in swimming? Well, I was thinking not only about, uh, you know, something I was focusing on, but um, on what I focus on right now with my swimmers, simply because yard swimming, it's, is uh, so much different from, uh, well, anything else, uh, even short course meters is uh, a little bit of a difference, but long course, you know, it's like two different events. So, uh, yeah, obviously that's something I like, but um, it's something that's very important for yard swimming specifically. And I feel like, you know, that's the audience. <laughs> <laughs> certainly in the U S that is our audience yard swimming is, is a culture. It's nearly a religion. Uh, and you know, who doesn't, who doesn't like short and fast stuff. Um, but sure. I mean, that, is, that is a big emphasis. So let's, let's start with just underwater kick speed. You know, you were a big underwater kicker. You, you were one of the best in the world at it. Um, I mean, what, when you think underwater kicking, what's your focus? What do you work on? Well, I always uh, try to try to teach, and that's what I was thinking. You know, you always should go from the core. Uh, even we call it, you know, it's kick, it's legs, but uh, in reality, it's mostly core. Obviously, your legs getting tired because it's such a big muscle, and uh, you're trying to use it in very um, specific but unnatural for human body uh, manner. Uh, so yeah, I definitely focus on the core. Uh, and flexibility with, uh, you know, sp specific body composition, you have to focus really on different things. Somebody have, uh, ha somebody will have really uh, flexible lower back and, or big feet. And, uh, you know, for somebody, it's not the case. So you have to work on ankle flexibility and just uh, a lot of stretching, a lot of specific exercises. Uh, so it, it really depends on, um, I guess, uh, your, your natural talent and what you lean towards too. Yeah. And I mean, for, for you, when you were developing your underwater speed, um, both when you were back in Europe and in the United States, uh, I mean, what did, what did you have to work on? What did you find most helpful? Uh, well, the, <laughs> to, to, to be great in underwater kick, I think, it's a uh, pretty simple advice, but first thing you need to do is to start actually doing them and not just for one set or like kick set or like underwater set, but all the time. So for me, it was not, not a, some um, really magical advice or some really high profile coach that told me something. It was just uh, when I was, when I was, I think 10, um, we, swam to 2000 in um, short course meters freestyle uh, just you know moderate speed but the goal was to do five butterfly kick from which wall which for 10 year old you know was a really really hard task and <laughs> I wasn't swimming for a long time at the moment I was probably swimming I don't know maybe for two years I progressed kind of quickly at the beginning but still and uh, I was the only one from the group who've done this five butterfly kick uh, from each wall. And I think at that moment, maybe a little bit later, I don't remember because, you know, it's such a young age, uh, something clicked that, you know, 
I just need to do this all the time. And uh, at first I started doing this for all strokes and it was really hard because it's your course. You just, you just do not breathe and it's really heavy. Uh, any practice in recovery turns it into, you know, brutal breath control exercise. So what I finally decided um, kind of move forward with, uh, I started doing this only for backstroke, which is my main stroke. So I accepted this as the only possible way I can swim backstroke, uh, doing 15s all the time. And I think from the age, maybe 13 until like 20, uh, I was doing 15 underwater for any time I swim backstroke at any point of practice. So warm down, warm up, you know, main set, doesn't matter what kind of set, all out or just, you know, uh, pace uh, or easy. I was just doing 15 underwater all the time. So I guess that's uh, that's a good starting point just to start practicing it. That sounds brutal. That, I mean, that, like you yeah. said, that sounds really, really hard, especially if you're doing like easy backstroke. That makes it very, very not easy, I'm assuming. <laughs> Yes, it is. Yes, yeah, one of the um, one of the hard, hardest sets, I think, for a uh, short course I was doing on a regular basis. It was uh, three when I was younger, uh, three three hundreds backstroke, and you just have to descend one to three. Uh, but the only thing you have to do is uh, uh, is uh, hold fifteen underwater from every wall. And uh, one, one more catch, you have to do stroke count for every 25. So you basically cannot increase stroke count. So it's in and, and kick count. So you're just working on really, really powerful kick on every kick and really powerful stroke on every stroke. And, you know, if, if you do this correctly, uh, it turns into a pretty brutal set. And it's obviously wasn't the set by itself. It was more like a finisher at some point either finishing for the week or like finisher for some kind of workout um but yeah the good advice i have to um to all swimmers who just want to get good at it just uh, start practicing you know in a, in a regular practice let's say 5k um you have how many of that it's basically uh 200 200 turns if i'm not mistaken 199 turns so you have 199 attempts to practice your underwaters. I mean, <laughs> that that set by itself sounds like a monster. Um, be, because if if kick count and stroke count sounds the same, do you remember about what you were holding on those? Like, so how many underwater kicks, and then how many backstrokes would you take per 25? Uh, yeah, yeah. So on the easy one, even right now, on the easy swimming, I would do six uh, kick which is going to take me from like for, you know, pace or just easy swimming. Well, on easy, easy, maybe five sometimes, but uh, that will take me straight to 15. Uh, and uh, for the pace like this sets, I would stick most of the time to seven. It obviously depends a little bit on what kind of state you're in, in your training. Sometimes you like just, uh, you know, jelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, most of the time that was seven. And for the stroke count, I do not remember really well in meters. Um, I believe that it was seven and eight going to the turn or six, seven going to the turn. Because in yards, I usually do like four and fifth to the turn. Mm -hmm. So I guess, yeah, I guess it's two more strokes probably. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that's... <laughs> it's pretty wild that's a that's a good set i i'm definitely going to clip that one out and 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 that that's our teaser right there because that's yeah. uh i like that a lot and so so as you progressed i mean did your coaches kind of mold this around you i mean I, i'm guessing they were pretty encouraging with this because this isn't something again that they were like all right you have to be at 15 this is something that that you initiated so how did they react to this? Uh, I'm actually not sure. I, well, first of all, I, I absolutely love my coach that uh, I had back home. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's big on uh, focusing on details. And I'm not sure if 
that's that was something I helped him to start focusing on more, or he was focusing on this uh, even before. Um, but yeah, I mean, they were definitely encouraging, and uh, he was also big on you know being efficient. So I think I think I think to some point maybe I struggled a little bit at some point because most of the time I was focusing a lot on power per stroke on length of the stroke and not enough on tempo. So I was for a long period of time, mostly when I was younger, uh, I was really low tempo swimmer, which is, you know, I'm six, uh, six, six, zero, uh, height. So I'm not the tallest swimmer, but I was always relatively low on the stroke count. And, um, because of that, I think because of this, uh, specific training that I've done, I struggled a little bit with the tempo. So it took me a few years when I was older to, to kind of pick up on that. But yeah, it definitely comes from the coach and the swimmer. You couldn't be one or another. You know, we always have to work in the syn- synergy. Hmm. And then you, you come to the United States, you get to Florida State and the, the NCAA system. And how did that change if it did at all, your approach to underwaters? Uh, well, I kind of, after some period of time, even before I came to US, I kind of started um, not giving myself slack, but I guess the training started getting a little bit more serious. And uh, I think first time I stopped doing underwaters all the time, that's the first time I tried high altitude training. <laughs> and uh so yeah we went uh we went to georgia the country mm. um and it was 2000 meters or around that maybe i think 19 1900s uh wow. and the very first practice i obviously started doing what i was normally doing and i just couldn't hold my breath even for 15 that was my first time ever it was just uh you know a little bit shocking how how hard it is to breathe and uh just do any kind of breath control. So I think, uh, I think that was the point where I um, start a little bit backing up on when I do this. It was definitely for main sets, definitely for kick. Uh, but sometimes on the easier swimming, on warm up, I was uh, just kind of having, giving myself a little bit of a break um, mm-hmm. from underwaters or on drills, you know, to, to have more time to do the drill. I guess if you kick to 15, it's like one cycle of a drill and that's it. Yeah. So yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't because it was uh, getting harder. It was because of a little bit change of focus. Hmm. Which, I mean, if you were doing, you know, underwater to 15, since you were 13, it seems like the change of focus is probably a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, as soon, as soon, like when I was 13 and this, turning point kind of um the thing with me and underwater start happening i saw immediate uh improvement in my speed and uh um you know i i qualified for first nationals when i was 14 uh for short course um and yeah i mean underwater has brought a whole different level into into my training because uh likes the the hardest muscles of your body if you ever like done lifting or anything you probably know the like, leg day is the heaviest day so same for swimming if you kick a lot and uh specifically butterfly kick breaststroke not so much uh you know it, it it it's a lot heavier but it also gets you in shape a lot quicker and keeps you there hmm. and so i mean speaking of kind of changing it up switching your focus you know if, if you're doing consistently kicking to 15 every time you swim backstroke off of every wall for, you know, six, seven years. Yeah. When, when you get to that transition point of, okay, I'm going to give myself a, a little slack. Um, what, I mean, how do you improve your underwaters? It seems like at that point, you know, you've been doing kind of this same thing for so long. Um, I mean, did you have to change anything besides kind of not doing it all the time to, take your underwaters to another level? Uh, I think it's going to be a couple of things. Uh, obviously you can change things up and, um, um, new kind of training and, uh, new just, uh, trends and developments in swimming obviously help. 
but I would say the biggest thing is probably consistency. Um, I, 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 I truly think, and I sometimes tell some of my, my best swimmers uh, that you, you think that you swim all out and put in 100%, but in reality, you just didn't discover yet what 100% is. Uh, you just don't, even like 17, 18 year, year olds, they probably didn't discover how to push their body consistently. So I'm not talking about one particular workout. Obviously, for one workout, they probably do push themselves 100% sometimes, hopefully most of the time. Uh, but, uh, you know, staying consistent with that effort, that's what makes a difference. It, because, you know, swimming, we do a lot of repetitive stuff. So I, I believe the thing that makes the biggest difference is how consistent you are with uh, not only speed and under the effort in terms of, you know, how much you push yourself, but also being smart. So like focusing on details, bringing this focus into every practice. I mean, and it, I hear that a lot when we have uh, young men and women heading to college, you know, it's, they, they get there and they're like, well, it's not necessarily any one workout that's like harder than what I was doing in high school, but it's the, it's the load. It's like the consistently having to, to be expected to push, you know, get, get to a hundred percent effort every single practice. Whereas in high school, I think, you know, they were, maybe they were less consistent or there was just different expectations on them. I, I totally agree with that. I think the biggest difference maker is uh, consistency. And also, um, I would assume that's the case for a lot of fast swimmers in, in smaller clubs. Uh, I have, uh, his name Hayden Kwan. I have a swimmer who's uh, unofficially, there is a long story, but he's an officially Hong Kong record holder for 200 backstroke long course. Hmm. Uh, and uh, Junior Nats finalist. So he, um, uh, I got, gosh, I lost, I lost it. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. So he's basically doing a lot of training by himself because it just, uh, not a lot of fast swimmers who can match and uh, his speed and, uh, for certain sets, you know, other swimmers just don't need to do the same thing. So mm -hmm. it's, for me, it's a challenge to um, keep him motivated. It's, it's, it's not a challenge in terms of his character. He is really motivated himself. But, you know, when you're working hard for a few weeks, it's, I feel like a need from me to support him uh, during certain, yeah. certain sets. And uh, I think the biggest difference when these kind of athletes go to college is that you know, they hopefully not even the best in their group. And I say hopefully because it's really great to have something that you have to chase. It's, it's so much harder that I, that's again, that's my belief. It's so much harder to push yourself when um, people chase you. Uh, and uh, that's what I wished for. And that was the initial idea to move to United States because um, most of the time I was trained by myself for the majority of my career. And, uh, you know, swimming by yourself. It was just a kind of lucky train camp when I would find uh, somebody to race or some like, I don't know, um, some other stroke swimmer who I can train with for, for backstroke. Um, so yeah, that's definitely the biggest difference maker. And also the number of hours they spend at the pool uh, because, you know, from the, from the time I joined national team from maybe 15, years old i was spending probably at least uh six seven hours at the pool i'm i'm counting not only not only swimming but you know warm up before practice uh and practice itself and drilling time and then second workout and uh these swimmers some of them spend like two hours a day and that's it and some of them don't even come to every workout so it's like eight hours a week it's basically something that i was doing per day yeah. which is uh, to some point just laughable to expect really drastic improvements from train eight hours a week. Um, but yeah, there, there is opportunity to, to improve with uh, club swimming. 
And especially when you have a dedicated coach, which I consider myself, obviously, one of them. Uh, but it's also should be um, some dedication from, from the swimmers themselves. And I think that's probably the bigger part than uh, kind of intensity or how, how coach good at motivation and, you know, encouragement. That's probably secondary. The first, it, it should go from, from the swimmers themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think that's a good point. And, you know, swimmers should have that internal motivation. Coaches should be trying to support that. Um, I want to bring it back to the, the underwater focus, underwater kicking. You know, you said it comes from the core. And I think, you know, swimmers do hours and hours of, of ab exercises, ab workouts on dry land. Is there anything in particular that you found works really well to strengthen your core in the water aside from obviously just, you know, doing a lot of dolphin kicking? Uh, well, it's, I believe that it's not the specific exercise that, um, gonna strengthen your core a lot, but more bringing the focus to the core. So mm -hmm. a lot of the time, um, body naturally finds the easiest way to do the exercise and most of the time it means disengaging the core because uh, if you remember from the time you were a swimmer if you engage your core properly it just takes a breath away it just you know it's a different level of endurance to be able to engage this core all the time um, and engage it properly so what our bodies tend to do is just, you know, disengage it. You breathe, you like relax your stomach on the breath in and it feels good. Your hips sink. <laughs> Obviously it's not good for the speed, but it feels so much easier. Uh, you know, for, for a longer stuff, you just feel more comfortable and it takes extra effort. And again, mostly, mostly here. So level of focus um, to uh, keep this core engaged. So for, for even simplest exercises, um, like, uh, you know, I, I like tabletop crunch, even a lot of my swimmers consider it that's a rest exercise, you know, tabletop crunch when you connect opposite arm and leg to the elbow and then straighten it in a tabletop position. So uh, this kind of stuff, if you do this correctly and bring focus to the core uh, and uh, like plank on one arm or lifting one leg, and uh, plank with shoulder taps, um, you know, good mornings. And there, I mean, there is a lot of exercise to go through, but the, the, the focus is to just bring this tension to the core or even regular sit-ups. You know, most people would do, I, first of all, I'm not a fan of any sit-ups except locked uh, fingers behind your head because anything else I feel like kind of makes it a little bit easier unless you really know how to bring specific focus which is not the case with most uh high school swimmers huh? you know i'm not talking about olympians they know what they do most of the time uh there is some like crazy talented but most of the time you know they have enough experience to experiment yep. uh so with a sit-up people would tend to like go to the knees right but what's the point of this like this top top motion you already disengage your apps and there is nothing there so mm -hmm. something like that just adjusting this exercise that you see most of the people most people do incorrectly and just keeping the tension like getting up a little stopping a little bit before 90 degrees and going back that's already going to bring a lot more engagement to the core uh, but that's also we're talking about isolate isolated exercise uh, like trx TRX is a very useful thing, which I found really hard to use with, again, high school swimming, because you just have too many people. So, mm -hmm. I mean, generally, I would say just uh, for, for, for the coach, my challenge is to figure out the way to engage core on regular exercises and just uh, maybe really check on swimmers or help them feel how they engage their core. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Pro high knees. High knees would be a good example where you can really fire up your core uh, or you can just, you know, jump up and down with, with your legs and the core would be completely disengaged. 
but you can really fire this core up and, and warm up and, you know, incline a little bit forward, keep this body really tense and yeah, you're going to be working in your core. I mean, just hearing you talk about that, I would never expect high knees to be a core engagement uh, exercise, but uh, oh, it's for the core, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's kind of amazing how many things you can get the core involved in, and mm-hmm. then that you know that really does push it to a whole nother level. Like you said, I mean, if you've ever just again engaged the core, flexed your abs during while you're swimming normal freestyle, it's like whoa, that's way different yeah yeah obviously we're not trying to uh just flex but there is supposed to be a certain um certain goal for a core engagement like for freestyle you know tucking your hips forward a little bit to leave this this lower back up or like for butterfly on the catch to to improve your um kick strength um but yeah, with uh, if, if if we're talking about what I do specifically with my swimmers, uh, it's still most of the stuff, mo- most stuff in the water. So we just uh, you know focusing on various kick exercises, various arms position, and uh, just uh, using the nav butterfly kick to build this core strength. And again, it's always there is always a way to avoid using your core. So people who want to avoid it and for coach, you know, when I stand on deck, it's uh, if you have like even 20 swimmers, you're probably able to judge if they engage their core or not, but you're not going to be able to pay attention to every single person and control it. So if they want to avoid it and they want to skip using core, they actually can. So it's really mm-hmm. up to the swimmer to, to learn and uh, use the knowledge we're trying to pass and, you know, improve their speed. Yeah. I, I, I want to transition to turns now and to start that, uh, how, you know, tell me, tell me what you feel is important or for, for younger swimmers to know about turns, but also is, I mean, do you use your core and when you're doing a good turn and if so, how? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You're using your core to improve your streamline from a push-off. So I, I believe that the most important part of your turn is actually push-off. So basically, when you finish your turn, mm-hmm. so how you how you finish your turn and transition to the next 25. And uh, I like to consider turn a part of the next 25 than the part of the previous 25. Because, you know, I know that most of the people, they're going to turn fine if and again, just to clarify, when I'm talk, we're talking right now, discussing things, I most of the time talk about like more advanced swimmers. So like 14 plus, you know, more advanced group, mm-hmm. not talking about like very beginners or intermediate groups. Uh, so yeah, I, I like to think of a turn as a method to improve your following 25, not to finish this current 25 as fast as it, as you can so the common i think theme especially in yards when you have like you know so many turns is people try to rush the turn they try to focus on the speed of their rotation which is great i mean obviously you should master that everybody should be good at it and most of us swimmers like very impressive with this because um you know you you train this from the very beginning uh, most of the people do yards. I was very, very impressed by, you know, speed of the turns, but the vast majority of like ACC, SNC, AA swimmers. But if you screw up, you push off, there is no point of this quick rotation. You know, on rotation, you can win compared to another fast swimmer, what, like 500 of a second, maybe 110. But the push off could improve your next 25 by like half a second. So, you know, I believe the 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 proper placement of legs, uh, proper streamline after the turn. So really keeping this core engaged and push off, uh, pushing off in in a really perfect streamline, not having any resistance, not trying to like push off and immediately bend, trying to like go into a fly kick uh, as soon as your legs leave the wall um, is really key for a good turn. So um, 
I, I like to think and uh, again, tell some more advanced swimmers that uh, while when we watch the race, every element and turn specifically should be seamless. So it should not be any speed difference or fluctuation in between like previous 25 turn and the next 25. Obviously you have some acceleration when you push out, but you know, like uh, delays when you like pause in the last stroke and then you turn or uh, you just like accelerate last two strokes. It should be seamless. But at the same time, when you race, I like to think of a turn as a separate element to, to, element to focus on. So really kind of, obviously, we're not talking about like, um, um, like nationals level when you just able to like lock in and focus on the race itself on the effort, but more like a seasonal meets or just uh, any meet for a little bit younger swimmer when they really working on these kind of details. Uh, so seeing this as a separate element to focus on and, um, Obviously, that's a quick element. It's something that quick happens like this. Um, but when, when you do this all the time, even if we're talking about like one second, it's enough time to think. It's enough time to like feel every element, like focus on leg, leg placement and uh, just uh, giving yourself just enough time to properly place your legs on the wall and push off and not just, you know, finish the turn, kind of have some space in between your foot and the wall and then try to push off through the water and hit the wall. So, uh, yeah, that's another good, 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 uh, focus point. I like the turn to kind of go right into the wall and feet supposed to basically maybe even like rub the wall a little bit to be able to push off right away and not have some water in between your leg and the wall and then push through the water and push off. So it's the same, it's the same as jump on adrenaline, you know, try to like jump up, land and jump again, which is harder than just to jump or like step in and jump. So basically you don't, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to have this space in between your leg and the wall when you like rotating, you just, you just so mm -hmm. much harder. If you're like big dude, you, maybe you have, you can get away with that, but, uh, and really powerful, but for most swimmers that going to cost um, cost a lot of time and, mm. and energy. Yeah. Which, which makes total sense. And then, I mean, going into a breakout, what do you, what do you think the keys are? What did you find, you know, worked for you, um, when thinking about a breakout? Because again, I think those are little details that most swimmers, especially at maybe a high school level, even a collegiate level, don't put a ton of thought into, but like you said, you know, that can be half a second easily per 25. Yeah. Well, um, even a good example would be with, uh, uh, Sam swimmer, Hayden Kwan, what we were focusing on and trying to fix is, uh, uh, at the very beginning, he was doing butterfly kick into his first stroke. Under well, first of all, a lot of swimmers don't do your first stroke underwater, which is, um, I believe not that hard to learn. And I believe it's a mistake if you don't do first stroke underwater and, uh, you know, break through and then make your first stroke on the surface. Are you talking about backstroke? Uh, well, back or free. Okay. Okay. And, you know, but for butterfly and breaststroke, it's just a catch that's, that's underwater. Maybe half of the stroke even. Uh, but for freestyle and back, you know, that's a full stroke underwater. Uh, mm -hmm. that's you're supposed to make before breaking the surface. And, um, so he was doing fly kick with this first truck, which leads to a lot of turbulence and, uh, just, uh, losing a lot of speed on the breakout. Um, if you're able to do this seamlessly, it's not a problem, but, um, you know, for this specific case, it was a problem. So we transitioned to, uh, flutter kick as soon as you start pulling. So you, finish your last flat kick, you flutter kicking and start pulling on the, mm -hmm. on the very first stroke. Mm -hmm. And that led to a lot of improvement. And another thing is obviously holding these underwaters and uh, for as long as you hold the speed, not just holding for no purpose, but for, for as long as you hold the speed, if you let legs just done, there's no pur purpose of holding underwaters. You're just not gonna, not gonna have speed. Um, 
but you know, it's, it improves in training. And if you're able to extra one meter, two meters underwater, it's probably like half a second per, per meter underwater on the last wall. That's why you see so often high level swimmers like, uh, uh, Tom Shields or Chad Leclerc, uh, win on the last 25 because they hold underwaters. There is somebody who, um, like, you know, Caleb Dressel, who able not to hold underwaters for as long, not right into 15 and just pull incredible power and incredible speed on the surface and win the race. Uh, but you know, that's just another example. Uh, but underwater speed definitely, um, I believe easier to maintain, to finish the race. If you, if you train that compared to like, keep the body in the proper position and try to like accelerate so much on the surface compared to other people standing underwater. So, um, yeah, basically two things first focusing on accelerating when you break through, because you're not just kicking now, you're also pulling. So for a short period of time, it should be acceleration, not slowing down on the first stroke uh not rushing that stroke so you have so much speed that it doesn't make sense to rush the tempo on the first couple of strokes which is a lot of swimmers tend to do they just like you know break through and the tempo like they just spin and then get into proper rhythm uh so if anything first stroke could be just a tiny bit longer barely visible but a tiny bit longer than uh all the rest of the strokes and uh well, obviously holding them. Um, the basic start to, st to start with, the basic thing to start with should be honestly the number of kick you do. You should know that number. You should, you should know this, you should master it. You should just practice it all the time. Same number, not different numbers. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we, we, if we talk about like specific elements, that, those probably gonna be uh, three. Proper first stroke on the breakout, proper legs transition, um, and just the length. Mm -hmm. uh, we're d I'm down to about five minutes here. And, you know, I think we've covered quite a bit of ground. We've gotten into some of those nitty gritty details of underwater yep. kick, core strength, turns, breakouts. Is there any, anything we missed or anything you want to dive into? Um, yeah. Um, well, also, also, uh, we didn't talk about the body position in terms of not the, you know, high body position, but in terms of movement left and right, that's obviously specific for freestyle and backstroke. I believe that's also a big thing. Um, why, you know, core is important. Just come back to core strength. It, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, as you can see, like it's everywhere. We it's swim everywhere. From, from a core, you know, if we, if, if you look at the fish, you know, they kick with their core. So ideally <laughs> that's what you want to do. Uh, so yeah, any movement left and right, which tends to happen towards the end of the race or when you approach the turn and just fo focus tend to shift a little bit and you, you, you focus on, um, basically not the, not the wrong thing, but maybe, uh, just not giving enough focus to the core position anymore. Mm. Like, like looking at the flags for backstroke, you're just like expecting the wall freestyle and these hips try to start to like wobble a little bit. You obviously uh, have a lot more resistance now and uh, you're definitely going to lose speed over there. And that again, yeah, it's, it's especially on top of the water when you're swimming core isn't something that's always necessarily top of mind you know it's you always talk about the rotation on backstroke mm -hmm. and freestyle but you never it it doesn't always get brought up of like okay but you need to use the core to to use that rotation yeah rotate from the core it, that's entire entire thing like uh you know for russian twists people tend to just uh shift their arms around but what about like <laughs> rotating the shoulder like that's, that's a point to rotate the shoulder. That's why we do like Russian twists and people just, you know, shift their <laughs> arms and that's how you swim guys. That's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, those are basically two different things. And, uh, sometimes you can get away with that. Like, let's say Ryan Lofty for backstroke, you know, he's like leaning left and right a little bit 
but that's just a particular case. Sometimes you can gain more than you sacrifice. You sacrifice a little bit of something. Uh, mm-hmm. Like with the, with the arms movement underwater, which, you know, Caleb Dressel, the probably at the moment, the most famous example of doing that. Uh, but I always had that. And uh, I'm just thinking who's going to be, well, without bringing any more examples, still you sacrificing uh, your st- streamlineless, <laughs> I guess we can say, uh, you're not as streamlined anymore. You're probably catching a tiny bit more resistance, but you gain more power. You're able to use your core more and uh, you gain range of motion. So it's, uh, it's a matter of staying efficient with what you're good at. And even if you're sacrificing tiny bits, something else, but gaining more, it's, it's going to worth it. Hmm. That, yeah. And I, I've had that discussion before of, okay, do you, do you go from the core down or do you do, you know, does your whole body, do your arms get involved too? And uh, like you said, I think it's, yeah, it's kind of a cost benefit situation. Um, like Kavik, what? Miller or Kavik or, mm-hmm. uh, um, what was the oh yeah ian crocker yeah he, there, there were two who were not using a lot of uh, you know upper body movement but small small uh high high tempo kick and were really effective with that yeah yeah i, I actually coach with ian now and um oh yeah and yeah he he talks about that a lot just yeah it's a big mystery this is like he's a big mystery for me from the standpoint of like when he was an athlete, like how he performed and how early he finished his, uh, you know, pr- very, very high level career with his amazing, basically breakthrough results at a time. Uh, yeah. I would have a lot of questions for him if I could get a chance to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe I can, maybe that'll be our next podcast. We'll, we'll drag you in and, <laughs> yeah. um, well, Pavel, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for hopping on again and, and getting into the nitty gritty. It's so fun to just talk about these little details that can sometimes get lost in the mix of, you know, grinding and training. And um, it's it's always good to just kind of keep that brain stimulated. Um, any any parting thoughts before we sign off today? I think we're good. Just, uh, just wanted to say thank you. I loved it. Thank you, Colin. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.